Once again, and welcome to my studio. And today we're going to do a short film on still life. Still life is the next project, as we had promised. We first did the uh, Impressionism, American Impressionism, French Impressionism, Tonalism, and then we did a transition between Tonalism and realism, and today we will start in earnest on realism. And the first painting we'll do is still life. Still life is pretty magnificent work. Although it was never really regarded as a genre in and of itself, for many years, even beyond the Renaissance, uh, maybe not until the 16th century or so, was still life appreciated as an art. Uh, still life is a depiction of inanimate objects, of food, flowers, shells, and handmade things, man-made man things also, glasses, books, vase, as actors in the painting. Still life is a very ancient form of painting and can be found in the pyramids and most of the tombs in some ancient religions. The people believed that the paintings themselves would, after death in heaven, become real and become food for the person who passed away the reality of that, of course, is questionable. However, who knows? During the Renaissance, uh, it was mostly used for backgrounds or for suggestions of things happening in religious paintings. And uh, it really had very little weight. Leonardo da Vinci did many still lives of fruits and things as studies and then would include them into his major paintings but did not do still life as an item in and of itself in the 16th century the dutch and the flemish really made this come alive and they painted everyday items for instance butcher shops and um, cobblers and the lowest form of labor as still life, or at least the tools of the labor, if not the labor itself. A green grocer, for instance, and the items that a green grocer would have on his shelf. In the 19th century, the academic French came up with a packing order of what's the most important type of painting and what's the least important type of painting. And in their analysis, the French decided that historical paintings, biblical paintings, and uh, also mythology, paintings about mythology, are the highest form of painted art. And the lowest form of painted art was still life interesting to me because even today still life is the most sought after especially in commercial art for instance if you own the hotel still lives of doorways still lives of dogs and cats in doorways things that would have the person who stayed at your inn feel comfortable as though they were home we are going to go through the whole process and we're going to do it as a European style painting uh, at the club, at my oil painting club, and I hope you join us. God bless you all and have a wonderful day.
This is a still life that I accomplished uh, four or five years ago. And it's important because some of my students think that doing a still life is very simple. You walk around your house and pick things that you like and put them on a desk and just go ahead and copy them. It's wrong. You need to plan a still life more than you plan an outside painting of some kind, uh, seascape, landscape, and so on, because you don't have any control or very little control over the things that are going on in, for instance, a landscape. It is what it is. You can add different pieces to it, however. In a still life, you have to plan every part of it. It's very important. Now, if you look at the still life, there are many items. And for instance, the lobster. Um, I went out and bought this lobster. And lobsters, first of all, when they're alive, they're pretty creepy looking. They are actually arachnids, or at least part of the arachnid family. And what that means, they're basically spiders. And it doesn't look all that appetizing to have a spider on your table. So I cooked him. And he turned red, as you would see him uh, on your table in a restaurant. And then also, I took away the legs, which gives a kind of a creepy feeling, and also the antenna. So I needed to plan out what this lobster looked like before I put him in the, uh, in the still light. Also, I put in a uh, pineapple. Pineapple, in and of itself, is pretty boring. And so what I did with the pineapple is at first I cut it in half. And to make it make sense, when it was cut in half, I had to lay it down on a dish, which is very beautiful, except it didn't give me an upward motion that I needed in my composition. So then I just cut a quarter of it, a piece of it out with a large knife. And as you can see, it's very beautiful inside. So with this modeled exterior and a very pretty interior, it becomes part of my still life and an important part of my still life. And I put the glasses, as you see here, I put the glasses because I wanted them to be transparent against a dark background. Again, you need to plan that part of it. And I wanted to put in uh, flowers. And so I tried several different flowers. And the colors were just not working. So fortunately, one of the florists in our town had Bird of Paradise. And the Bird of Paradise, of course, has these beautiful oranges and yellows and so on. So I was very lucky to have the Bird of Paradise. And then rather than just having them in a vase, this is not a vase, it's um, a cooler for a bottle of wine. And I borrowed it from a restaurant, a local restaurant. And so in essence, this would be brought to your table with ice in it and a bottle of wine. Uh, at your table in that particular restaurant, and they were very nice to allow me to use it for my painting. Also, the composition, and we'll get into that more in this particular project, but the composition of our pieces, tall items, near short items to give it interest, and the fabrics, and also in a still life, you have different materials. For instance, the reflections of a silver ball and the glass, of course, transparent glass, the uh, inside of a coconut. What does it really look like? Does it have that texture? Um, if you look at the tablecloths, there's two different tablecloths happening here. One was a heavy almost damask material, as opposed to two others that you can see the two other tablecloths. One was very thin and the other one, of course, a little thicker, so the folds change. All that planning must go into your still life. <laughs>
I'm going to show you today a uh, sketch technique, a drawing technique that was taught to me at one point I had studied industrial design along with architecture and art history and so on and so on. Um, but I had a professor back then when I was doing industrial design, his name was Jack Kovach, incredibly fine artist and a wonderful teacher. And he taught us this technique, and I'm going to teach it to you right now. What you need for that is a conti. And I have here, as you can see, I have them in a dish. Uh, sanguine conti. And conti is a hard pastel. And also what you need is a chamois or at least a piece of a chamois. And these, of course, you can buy in any auto store and use them to clean your car with. It's a piece of hide. Now, what we're gonna do is the same way when you do a painting, when you tone the canvas, we're gonna tone the paper. Now, you use for this newsprint, which is very inexpensive, and you use newsprint that is a rough surface. And so what I'm gonna do and you can see, here's my chamois, and I've used it many, many times, and it's loaded with Conti. So, what I'm gonna do is put it down. A nice, yeah, a nice film of Conti. And then I'm going to soften it, this is high on here, and I'm going to soften this with my chamois, my dirty chamois, and as you can see, it's going to make a very nice tone. And now I'm going to draw with the same color Conte on this tone page. Wonderful way to draw, and you'll see it was done all through the Renaissance, not necessarily Conte, but they're, they're part of it, their type that they used in those days. Now, the first and most important thing that you do when you start a drawing is to establish the horizon. Now, what is a horizon? My students ask me all this time, what's the purpose of a horizon? The horizon creates your point of view. And it always, 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 is straight out from your eye level. So if I stand up, I know that my, from my feet, from the ground to my eye level is five foot and four inches. So five foot and four inches, if I'm looking at that wall, if I went over and drew a line from the, from the uh, baseboard up five foot four inches, and I'm standing, that would be my horizon all the way around the room, no matter what I'm drawing at. Now, it doesn't mean that's your point of view. It means from standing, my horizon is that size, five foot four. Now, when I'm at that level, I can look down, I can go up to the horizon, and I can go up beyond the horizon. In the still life that we're going to attempt, we're going to make the horizon at sitting value. Here I am sitting on this stool. I'm gonna put my horizon at the sitting value of my uh, drawing. So it's gonna be relatively high on the page. So I'm gonna put it right here. That is forever my horizon. There are three things that are sacred in your drawing. The number one is the horizon. Once you establish that, that's it. That's your horizon. Now, we're gonna use one point perspective. And so I'm gonna make an X. And that X is gonna be vanishing point. Vanishing point, one point perspective means there's one vanishing point. Vanishing point, two point perspective would be two vanishing points, three point perspective, three, and so on 
Uh, and that's we we will get to those in a later uh, class. However, right now we're going to concentrate on one point perspective. Now, this is sacred. That vanishing point is sacred in our drawing. We're going to draw, again, a still life, and we're going to use items for this still life that we're going to later transfer onto canvas and paint. I have chosen two items that we're going to use in our painting, and we're going to draw them first, of course. And I have this glass container, very pretty, up on a little pedestal and so on, and we're going to draw that first. And then I also have a picture, as you can see. Relatively uh, simple to draw if you understand one point perspective. And so we're going to work with those two to start the, as the beginnings of our uh, drawing. Now, what I need to do is establish where. I'm going to place, we'll start with this, where I'm going to place this container in my drawing. And once again, I don't need to sit and look at these things and try to copy them at all. I'm going to use my mind. I'm going to use my background in perspective drawing. Now, I'm going to, here's my one point, and this in my mind has to be a tabletop tabletop on which I'm going to set these two items. So I'm going to put the first part, this first item, from here to here. So from the top rim to the bottom, I'm going to put, I'm going to establish that on my tabletop. And that, I said there were three things and again, this is conjecture. There's no need for me to go crazy measuring it and so on. I just need to put it on here. Now this, I said there were three things. So it's going to be that tall. Again, it's all conjecture on my part. But horizon line, vanishing point, and this is called the leading edge. In one point perspective, all lines that are vertical, all lines that are horizontal are straight. So I'm going to establish first the width. How wide is it from here to here? How wide is it as compared from here down? And if you look at it, it's almost a square. Almost a square. It's a little taller than it is wide. So I'm going to establish here and here, and I think I'm going to move a little bit this way. I don't want to run out of paper. So I have this and this and this and this. That's my leading edge. I'm going to take the leading edge and transfer it over to here. Try to make it as straight as you can. Cross and transfer it down here. Okay, now what we're going to do with this, so far we've created a plane. So far we've created a piece of glass that's standing up. Now what we're going to do is create a glass box so that we can take that shape and fit it into this glass box. So from here, here's my vanishing point. I'm going to come down to this corner. I'm going to come over to this corner. And now I'm going to take this. Now you have to, now here's where practice comes in. You have to practice visualizing what does that rectangle look like in perspective. If you're looking at a rectangle, here, if you're looking at a rectangle like this and it's flat, and that's what we have now. What happens to this shape as we turn it away, away, away? What now does this look like? The distance from here to here, let's make a mark on that. 
the distance from here to here in my vision when it's straight to me is, you know, eight and a half inches. Now, as this turns away from me, pivots on this corner, that distance, if I can imagine it flat, that distance from this wide is now really only this wide. So you have to practice that. You have to practice visualizing this in space. So I'm going to come straight down where my eye sees it. And here, let's just go down a little further. And here, and here, and that becomes the second piece of glass. Now I have one piece of glass this way and one piece of glass that way. Now I'm gonna go from the vanishing point from this corner and project it. And I'm gonna go from this corner that I've already established that this to this and this to this are what they supposed to be. I'm gonna come straight across as we talked about. And I'm gonna create here top of this glass box and from here I'm gonna pull it down. Also one of the things about using Conte and a chamois is this is now in my way. Even though that's my leading edge I didn't quite erase it. I just kind of softened it out because I'm, I don't want to get confused. I don't want to confuse the work lines. So now I'm going to go from the vanishing point to this corner. Down, 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 and here, and as I dropped this corner down, right here, drop this corner down, drag this straight across, here, so this is my bottom, this, if I straighten this out a little bit, this is my top, okay? And again, it's a glass box. So you can see here, 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 and here. So get the chamois. I'm going to just kind of get a little color here so you can see it. Here it is. And here is the other side. All right. So there's that. This takes time. You have to practice. I will give you at the end some homework to do because we're going to do several of these. Now, try to get it as straight as you can. Now, we're going to inscribe. This is a square. This is also a square. Now, what we're going to do is get a square. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay, a square of paper is perhaps this big, like this. So it's pretty much square, here and here. Now, this item is round, as you can see. And so what we're going to draw is this one, two, one, to three legends, as though these were glass shelves inside that box. And I think the first, the first one we have, the one that's sitting on the table, the top one, which is up here. So we got this one, we got this one, and now we need this one. And it looks about one third, two thirds. So let's do that. Let's go back to our Leading edge, and don't forget, we transferred the leading edge here. So if we look at this leading edge and say, okay, that's about half. So let's take it into thirds, so we're about there. So what we're going to say is this is the third. So that's going to represent this, this plate that we're putting in now. It's going to represent this part right here going to represent this part of this shape. So, again, if it's horizontal or vertical, it's straight. So let's go straight across here. 
And now back to the horizon, like this. And then across the box, straight, like this. And then from the, the vanishing point here. Now you'll notice here, we have one, that's the base here. We have one shelf, there's the shelf right there. And then we have the top right here. Not too, it's a little crooked, but it's not too bad. And here is the shelf, here's the shelf, here's the shelf, and so on. A little bit crooked. Okay. So one, two, three sections. Straighten this out just a little more. And we're looking pretty good. Now, inside this square, this square, this square, we're going to put an ellipse. An ellipse, in essence, if you find this, if you find the center of the square, project it out. And project it down. That's the center of the square and now we want to put a circle. So it's got to reach here, it's got to reach here, it's got to reach here, and it's got to reach here. So now sketching wise we're going to sketch in the circle. Now in essence that's a circle, well kind of, that's yeah, a little better now. That's a circle inside a square. That's a circle inside a square. But the same situation with the foreshortening, as we turn this, the round shape now, of course, is gonna look shorter from here to here, and it will become elliptical. The shape then in art is called an ellipse. So what we need to do now, is to find, like we just did, we'll find the center. We're going to use the corners here and here, and the corner here and here. And now I know that that is the center of this square in perspective. Same song, second verse. I'm going to take this corner and bring it here. This corner and bring it here. And you'll see the center of this square should be straight up. And it's pretty good. Even drawing angular as I am, straight inside of the Okay, so now, same thing. I'm gonna go across and across, here and here. And the center is right there, right there. Okay, and so I'm gonna go straight up. Now, that, that from here to here, that line that you see there is as if you took this piece and were able to drop a plumb bob right down through the middle and hit the table underneath, straight down and out here. So that's what this line represents. Now, as a, as a circle, we're gonna do the top, that's a circle, now as we turn it, into perspective, it becomes visually an ellipse. So let's inscribe our first ellipse over here. Inscribe our first ellipse, and here it is. Right. And now, same song, second verse. Here, you have to touch here, keep straight down from my vanishing point. Here, it's got to touch here and here. So now I'm going to create the ellipse that fits inside of this glass shelf. And here now is our circle. Here it is. Inscribed in. Okay. There's a circle, and now is because of the visual, it becomes an ellipse. And I have one more down here. Same thing. So I'm going to, I know if I go straight across from the center and from the vanishing point down, I know this one has to touch here, come around to here, 
and here, and here. So there's our three elliptical shapes that we need for this project. Now the top, the top ellipse and the middle ellipse, of course, the glass connects them to create the vase shape. So we're going to just drop a line straight down and here, like this. And the same over here, we're going to drop this line straight the edge of this ellipse, the little crooked. So, um, what is that a little bit here now? Okay. And now, I also on this have this, there's a little platform. First of all, there's a sphere right here. There's a sphere shape. So, I'm going to put in, this is not elliptical, it's straight. But it's got to come from the middle, and I'm going to have it come down to about here. And in there, I'm going to just inscribe a ball. An elliptical, I'm sorry, not an ellipse. A rounded shape. Okay. And here it is. Now, also, the foot of this, the foot of this is thick. So I'm going to take the same ellipse, take the same ellipse, and do it again. So that I have a thickness here, and here, there, and there. So now this foot, the glass becomes thicker, of course. And now I'm going to run it from the edge. I'm going to put another little ellipse here. And I'm going to run from the edge of that sphere and bring it right down to the edge of my lips and do the same on this side. So now, in essence, I have this here. Now it's glass, so I'm not gonna color it in so that it's not transparent. And here now is my jar. And I can use my chamois and soften this out a little bit. And soften this out a little bit. Same over here. And we will be studying shadows, light and shadows, in a later course. In this course, actually, but later on. Now we have the shapes for this piece of work. All in one point perspective. And now we did say that for now we're going to draw two items. This is the second. It's a, a picture. And we're going to put the picture next to, but a little further up the table. Now, if you look at the distance of both, they're pretty much, and one is as high as the other. Let me see if I can get you to see that. So the distance up is more or less the same. So what we can do, don't forget we have a leading edge here, right? We can take this leading edge and project it, project it, project it down the drawing. Same here, project it down the drawing. So from this edge, I'm gonna mark that a little better with a magic marker so you can see it. This corner and this corner and this, of course, was our leading edge. I want you to see this, it's important. And I moved that leading edge down the paper. So what I want to do with that is let it land. Now, one thing that's very important, and you'll see this a lot on amateur paintings, 
The first law of physics is that no two items can occupy the same space at the same time. Many things that are in science, many things that are in math, most things that are in math, uh, are absolute rules and laws in drawing and painting. So, what that means is if this is on the table and that's on the table, they cannot both, as you can see, you can't push one solid object into the other solid object. It just doesn't happen. And that's really the f one of the first, if not the first, law of physics. No two items can occupy the same space at the same time. Has to hold true in your paintings and drawings. Now, so what that means, this, you remember this, let's go on to, back to our marker, this space down here, which is the bottom of our container, sits on the table at that space. The other one cannot occupy that space. It has to occupy its own space. So, let's take our leading edge, transfer it, well, yeah, transfer it across the table as we did here and here. And now we know more or less this is about how large that. Let's try to get this straight so we sideways. But from here to here, and if they're sitting equally on the table, in other words, if one is sitting next to the other, if this is here and this is next to it on the table, uh, or if one's back further or so on, uh, let's do that. Let's transpose this leading edge backwards. Let's take this leading edge and push it back. If this is the back of the table, for instance, let's take this. We don't want it to be in line. We want it to push it backwards. So uh, let's do this. Let's take this and yeah, let's go right to here. Let's put it here because we know if we, that's a little fat. Let's go here. So if we know that this then and this and this and this is our front piece of glass, uh, the front of our box. Well, we don't want it to sit equal with this one. We want to push it back. So let's do this. Let's take this, run it back. And you've done this. I mean, uh, most people who draw or have drawn, have painted picket fences and so on. So what we need to do is move it backwards. So let's move it back. Yeah, we'll use the back side of that, and we'll say, okay, that's where we want the back of that to be. Now, we'll come down here, and we'll come down here, and we're going to say, we have to, again, we have to create the bottom shape of this glass box. This is a new one. And here it is, here and here. So this goes straight, that goes straight, that goes to the right, uh, to the vanishing point, on the horizon, and this also. So now, how tall is this back corner? Well, this is our leading edge. We took the leading edge from here, dragged it across the uh, drawing, and then we pushed it back. We pushed it back towards a vanishing point. So that leading edge is now here. Get this nice and straight line, here it is. Okay. And so our front plane here, our front visualization here and here, our front plane is now here. That's where it ends. This corner, of course, is going to go straight across, and it ends here. This corner from the bottom is going to work its way straight, 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 straight up. And now there's that. 
and this one nice and straight out, yes, and this straight across. And now, because what you're going to run into here now is because there's our vanishing point, the edge, this other edge, this other glass box plane is you're only going to look at the end of it. You're not going to see. It's going to look like this. It's not going to look like this or like that. It's going to just see the edge. And that's really what we have. So now all of this work lines are just in the way. So we'll kind of soften those out here. All right, so now they're gone. And now we have a glass box. Nice tall one here, here, and there. Okay, now let's look at the vase. And you'll see in this vase that it has another important ellipse, the same one that had. We have an important ellipse here, and we have another important one here, and one on the bottom. So we need to get one, two, three ellipses. And if you look at this vase and compare to this glass uh, container, we know that from here to here, we said, and from here to here, this is one third. And if we look at this from the bottom, one third, we look at this, this is basically one third from the top. So let's come down. Here's our leading edge. Let's come down a third. So if that's the leading edge, so we'll say here. So now we're going to put in the glass plane here and back here to the vanishing point, across, straight across. And as you see, there's not much, just a straight line on this side. So now we have one, there's the bottom, there's the middle, and there's the top of our glass box. Once again, we're going to inscribe three ellipses. Um, one, like this. There it is. One ellipse. Two ellipses. And one more, and as you can see, as you get closer to the horizon, the ellipses start to get a little more squat. The distance from here to here is different from the distance from here to here and distance from here to here. The distance across the box pretty much always, I shouldn't say always, mostly remains the same. Now our picture. Our picture is very feminine. I guess it's a feminine shape. But as you can see, from this ellipse, it bulges out and comes around. So let's get that part of it done. So let's make a very nice, from here, as you can see, it goes out like a teardrop. And here. So this around and here it is. So I got that. Now, also, if you took, if you look at this, now this bulge on this side and that bulge on that side are equal, just one's backwards to the other. So let's do that. Let's redo this on this side and do the best you can. It's a little different doing it sideways, but let's get it more or less to match. And we'll pick up the edge, and here it is. And here is the bottom. I'm sorry, there is the bottom part of the vase. Now, well, the top part of the vase splays out, goes the opposite way. So, what does that mean? This ellipse up here is bigger than our middle ellipse. So, what we have do is increase the size of our top ellipse. We've already established the ellipse. Now what we can do is expand. Let's expand that ellipse. Expand that ellipse. And here it is. It's the same ellipse. We just 
expand on it. The ellipse, the distance on the ellipse is more or less correct. So here we are. And again, if you really, if this were, say, an industrial design and you were working for a company that made vases, you're not going to be able to get away with forcing this. But for this drawing, and we will work on it when we do our underpainting, We'll make some corrections also in our drawing. But now let's get this and turn this the same way we did the bottom and the same over here and turn this in here. So now there in essence is the box. Oops. There in essence is our vase and it's a this is going to be glass, but this is going to be solid. So we have a shadow inside that. Here, I'm going to use my chamois shadow this side. And of course, we wouldn't see the back side of that ellipse, nor the back side of this, nor any of these work lines, because it's a solid piece. Also, let's put on the handle. And you know that all things that are vertical and all things that are horizontal are straight. So let's go straight out, come down, straight down, and let's go a little angular and hit the bowl just where it's wise. So there is the shape of our handle. There's the shape of our handle right there. And so what we're going to do with that is we're going to come out from the vanishing point. Watch this now. Out from the vanishing point. Out from the vanishing point. And we're going to put a backside. And from there we're going to go into and the same across the top like this. And then we're going to give it a thickness. So let's give it, that's the inside. Okay. What you're looking at on the vase is this. If you're looking at this vase straight on, this space represents that. Now we got to give it a thickness. So let's give it a thickness. So we'll give it a little thickness, about that much. Come down and down and across like this okay now that's a squared off piece but that's not what we're looking at we want this to round out a little bit so let us turn this edge turn this edge take the edge off of here turn this in flatten that out a little bit and here now here's the inside and here so now we have the vase. Now, of course, the handle is a little bit um, exaggerated because we want to make sure that my students, I want to make sure that my students have the idea of how to draw a vase. Now, and also the vase handle is a little large, a little thick and heavy. Sometimes it's good if it's thick and heavy because once the vase is filled the vase, once the pitcher is filled with water, it gets heavy. Of course, water even is six pounds a gallon and something like this may hold a half a gallon. So that's three pounds and if you lift up a pitcher where this is very flimsy, falls and breaks. So. There we are for that, and that's the beginning. And as you can see, they both occupy, let me get my marker out here. They both occupy different spaces. They're not interfering. And from the vanishing point, they are not interfering with each other. Okay, they are not, we're not trying to reinvent science. Okay, so this one sits on the table there, this one sits on the table there, and they are both proportionately 
correct towards each other because we took this leading edge, pulled it down. Here it is here, look, we pulled it down. We'll use a different color. Okay, we pulled it down, 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 like this. And the same from the top, we pulled this whole thing across, like this. And then we created another leading edge. We didn't create another leading edge. All we did was take that leading edge and drag it down. Now, we wanted this uh, picture to be behind, behind this glass piece. And so what we did is we took the leading edge, here's our vanishing point, and we created and pushed it backwards. And so here we are, as you can see, we push it backwards, put this here, we took our leading edge, and once again, pull that backwards, and from there, we created the glass box that that now is inscribed in. God bless you all, and have a good day. Yes, you're right. I didn't forget. I'm going to give you the homework. I prefer to call it busy work. Not necessarily. I prefer to call it practice. As though you were learning to play the piano, you have to practice. All right, here it is. First thing you're going to do is draw a horizon. Now, on that, you're going to do one point perspective on this page. So we're going to make a point. There it is. We're going to make a point, and this is going to be our number one vanishing point. Number one. It's going to be one point perspective, only one point here. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to put in some random lines. I'll put one over here. I'll put one here. Halfway. I'll put one above the horizon. Okay, now those, in essence, would at another time be leading edges, but let's create some one-point perspective boxes. There's the top of this one, and here. All right. Now, because it's one point, all horizontal lines are horizontal, all vertical lines are vertical. There's the front part, the glass box. Now, I'm going to come across. Now, you have, this is where you have to study. This is where you have to become the artist. You have to say that, okay, if that's a square, more or less, or a rectangle, what does it look like going away in foreshortening? So you have to get an eye for it. I'll give you an example. If you did this, does this side look as long as that side? Of course not. It looks much shorter. If you did this, get rid of that first line. Does this, just use your eye, does that eat, look equal to that? Of course not. It looks longer. So let's get rid of that second you have to eyeball this. You have to study it, practice it until you come to about here. And this is me drawing this. So here and here. And now again, across the top is straight. And there is your first. Homework. Study. Now we're going to use this one. And you're going to see where as it's below the horizon, you can see the top. If it's in line with the horizon, all you're going to see is the two sides. So let's do that. Here's the vanishing point here. The vanishing point here. All right. Now, of course, even still, this part is straight. One point perspective here and here and on its way back to the vanishing point 
How big does this appear in your eye? Once again, if it's way down there, you know that that's wrong. If it's way over here, it's wrong. It's got to be somewhere in between this. About like that. And now this. And I'm going to take out the horizon. We don't need to see that right now. And so I have, here's the front. Just so you can see it. Here's the front. And here's the front of this. And that's our number two. It's our second. That's our second box in perspective. Now, if we get closer to the horizon, okay, if we go from here to here, what's going to happen? You're going to see the underside and not the top. The same as this, just upside down, here and here. Okay, now let's create first the front face. Here it is. Again, one point perspective. So the horizontal lines are straight, the vertical lines are straight, go down, and down to the vanishing point, and this in perspective here, what does it look like? Of course, that's not it. This is more or less it, and here it is, and these half again straight, and this back to the horizon. So these have to look like rectangular and square boxes in perspective. This is your third. Do that. Practice that over and over again, and you'll be on your way.